Amen. If you could welcome uh, Paul and Ulla as they come to minister the word today. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful time to be in the kingdom of God, isn't it? Ireland are about to give a KO to the devil. <laughs> It's a terrific time. It's a time of renewal. It's a time of repentance. I like the idea of this national day of prayer and repentance. You know, uh, when Jesus came on the scene, he had a forerunner. Who was the forerunner to Jesus? John the Baptist. And he came saying, let's start this thing all over again. Let's get a brand new beginning. Let's get a new generation. who are not going to be in compromise with fusty old religion. And let's sort of get back to what God had in mind when he first called us. Of course, there were radicals. P people in the temple order thought they were uh, rebels. But they were rebels from the world to discover the kingdom of God. And they began to proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's pray. Let's turn to the throne of heaven. We have found the Messiah. How many would say we have found the Messiah? And we are coming to your throne now this morning, Lord. And we thank you for the wonderful streams of life, of energy, of the Holy Spirit, of wisdom, of revelation, of healing, of wholeness, of vision that is coming from your throne into our hearts and has been streamed into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Release revelation, release hope, release impartation, release vision here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We have a message for Ireland, don't we, as a body? We have a message of repentance, rediscover, rediscover, turn around and discover the kingdom of God. It's not what you think it is. It's not what religion has made of it. And that's what John the Baptist said. This uh, religion that we've inherited is not what God had in mind when we crossed, came out of Egypt and promised, entered the promised land. And this new generation, after 1,200 years of that old time religion, they would be able to be a breakout generation. And then from this uh, reform movement, from this turning movement, from this breakout movement, came Jesus. And John said, there's coming him, the true Lamb of God. It's not to be found in the temple. It's, become, it's to be found in the Son that God has sent and is appearing among you right now. And this is Ireland's time of repentance and great awakening. If we don't miss the hour of our visitation, we know that the majority of the Jewish people miss the hour of visitation. If we seek him with all our hearts and become people of the kingdom, we will be people to lead this new generation into the kingdom of God, to go further in the kingdom of God than any previous generation of believers. Now, uh, it's ever, <laughs> and he's calling disciples. Jesus came when his first words were, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. He began to bring, build this movement, not on the old fusty order of things, which he critiqued in a prophetic manner. <laughs> oh, we're not allowed to critique anymore because it's not politically correct. Jesus critiqued in a prophetic order, in a prophetic manner, the old order, and he began to call people to abandon the old temple in Jerusalem, and to look to the God's Lamb who was appearing there in the wilderness of Judea. And from this protest movement, which is really what John's movement was, came the emergence of the Messiah. And all, nearly all Jesus' first followers came for this protest movement. They said there's got to be something more than the religion of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and this religion that has become compromised with the political order of things. How Christianity in Europe has become compromised with politics, with religion, with establishment, with cozy societies, with nominal faith, with a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Will there not be a breaking with that order in our day? Will there not be a generation who will say, we want the real thing? We're not content with nominal, watered-down Christianity. We want the real Christianity of the Book of Acts and of the Gospels. There's a breakout generation, but it's a cost. It comes at a cost. We're called to be witnesses. The Greek word is martyrion, from which you get the word martyr. Will you be a martyr for the kingdom of God? I like this young boy that's come up here this morning, Dennis. He reminds me of St. Dennis. I read a story in one of these, some of these radical Christians of today. They like Dennis. 
Dennis was the, the uh, guy who brought the gospel to Paris. He's the patron saint of Paris. And you have, if you go to Paris, you'll see the metro stop Saint Denis and old places called Saint Denis. Well, he was a very, he was preaching to the pagan people in, in Paris. I don't know what the year was, maybe about 600, 400. I don't, don't really know. And they got very annoyed at Dennis for speaking the truth. Now, if you start speaking the truth, people will get annoyed at you. Now, you're just trying to love them, tell them a way to help, help them. But you see, you mean to say that I'm not already? Anyway, they interrupted Dennis's sermon by chopping his head off. And Dennis said, wait a minute, I'm not finished. He picked up his head, put it under his arm, and continued his sermon till he was finished and then went to heaven. That's the story about Dennis. <laughs> it was people like that who won Europe. I like the Dennis spirit. <laughs> we need a recovery of it. The Holy Spirit didn't make us to be a, a bunch of ecumenical wimps, but to challenge in a prophetic way the Christianity that we've inherited that's become so backslidden, so watered down, so nominal, so without power that it has no inspiration to offer this generation. Those days are coming to an end. We're at a time of repentance. Repent, turn, because the kingdom of God is at hand and the real Messiah is coming forward, shining as the sun and imparting his own life and nature. Christianity, not good if diluted. Now, some people were offended. But why should they? He's saying there's something better and there's something better lying ahead for this generation of believers. It says the whole, the whole of Judea went out to John the Baptist. It caught on. It caught on like the iPhone. The whole of them went out to be baptized. And he said, with this message of repentance. Not just a message, there's a little bit more. Not just a message, how can we stroke people? How can we just tell people you're grand the way we are, you are? It's something completely against the grain. It's a kingdom not of this world that none of the rulers of this world understand. If they'd understood it, they wouldn't have crucified the Messiah. We're part of his team. We're sharers of his life. We've, we've, we draw from his bloodline. We have his nature. We have his heart. We have his word like fire in our bones. We are people who challenge and confront the generation. We say, this is not that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. We want that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. We want a generation that will serve him. I think of the golden age, so-called golden age of Christianity in Ireland, when you had people like Brendan. Now you see, they make a saint of this. You put a you know, little halo on them. Saint, Saint Brendan. But at the time, he was just Brendan. And he was at the shores of Kerry. And he said, what would it be like? He was a scruffy fisherman. And he said, what would it be like if we kept on sailing west? Maybe there's people to reach out there. And he kept on sailing and sailing and sailing. What do you think his parents thought of him? Brendan, you're totally crazy. This Christian stuff has gone too much to your head. They probably sent a pastor after him to talk sense into him, to put that old religious controlling spirit on him. I tell you, two spirits that need to be controlled in Ireland if you've got a revival, the spirit of control, the spirit of religion. But they're coming down in the name of Jesus. They're coming down because they've lost the rule over us in Jesus' name. What a mighty God we serve. Jesus has come to offer vision for this generation. He says, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Follow me. Not politicians who are after this word. The men of this world, not the philosophers of this world. But this strange, mysterious, illuminated person. Fascinating person the one that God sent to be my leader and your leader, to be my direct leader, because 
when by the Spirit we call him Lord and Master, leader, guide, friend. We're joined to him. We're one with him as a husband is one with his wife and a wife is one with her husband. We're one with him. We've been drafted into him. We're married to no other. We're liberated from, no, from every other force to follow him. And he looked for those radical disciples. Now it's interesting, he didn't stroke them for two or three years and then say, well, after I've treated you all this and after I've showed you all the blessings, privileges and opportunities that come to you from following me, I'll, now would you follow me? At the beginning, before they knew what they were getting into, he said, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. There needs to be a radical, fresh, anointed rediscovery of the person, the call, the vitality of Jesus and the forsaking of any other interests, putting it into second, third and fourth place for the upward call of following him. It'll make you look like a fool. People will hate you. People will despise you. People will call you crazy. People will call you all sorts of names, but you'll get happy. People will burn you, try to burn you at the stake or whatever the moral equivalent is. Nula was speaking to this great friend of ours, a wonderful, great historical leader in the move of the Spirit in the 20th century. He died about five years ago. And Nula said to him, to this venerable guy who was 85 years old at the time, we had the privilege of knowing him as a friend. He said, you're getting too cozy with the old time religion. You're playing religious politics. You're just impressed by titles, robes, and colors. He said, because we loved him and he loved us. He said, Nula, you've just said enough to be burnt at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> Next week will mark the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. When a little monk from Wittenberg in Germany began to take on the old established religion, and said, it's not good enough. He wrote 95 propositions. He nailed them to the door of the cathedral. And they were all, these 95 theses had nothing to do with justification by faith or the authority of the Bible. They had to do with challenging just one particular subject, the idea of selling of indulgences. Praise God, we've come some way from there. But it began a spiritual revolution that was not completed by Luther. In fact, he fell by the wayside himself, falling into very evil anti-Semitism. But he released a force on Europe and upon the earth that is unstoppable. And it had the proposition that Christianity always needs to be reformed. It always needs the prophetic word. It always needs the challenge of prophets and teachers to bring us back to the power and the ways of the book of Acts. He said, basically what came out of this and of the challenges that came forth from his movement was that the authority of the scriptures must take authority, is higher than the authority of tradition or institution. And the authority of the scriptures bear witness to him. We want to see an, the church in Ireland, the body of Christ in Ireland, the people that take the name of Jesus, to be people who take the authority of the scriptures and of the word of God and put it above the authority of any institution or man. Yes. Not that we're against men, not that we don't respect men, their sacrifices, their efforts and so on, but we have no choice but to follow him. Here we stand. Here this generation who stand on the ground of the word of God, on the ground of the primacy of Jesus, on the ground of the leadership of Jesus, we cannot turn back. We respect and we forgive. But as for we and our house, we are determined to follow the banner of the blood of the Lamb. There will be consequences. If there is a reformation, if there is a revival, if there is a prophetic word, it cannot go forth without a reaction. And it's sometimes a violent reaction. Because there are, we wrestle with wicked principalities in the high places, in the darkness, 
not just with flesh and blood, who have done a great job in having a stranglehold over Ireland, locking us into tradition and control, so that for liberation we look for war or we look for communism or we look for some other thing, we look to humanism. And their rule is broken at the blood of Jesus. And when we come under his dominion, we come under the dominion of the highest kingdom of all. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. A generation will arise in this land determined not to submit to any false yokes of slavery who will emancipate themselves by the power of the blood of the Lamb from false dominions, from false bondages, from false brethren, from false t traditions, that have held our people bound for millennia. When will this generation of liberation come forth in Ireland? I say to you, it is now. How often the Lord would have poured out his spirit on this land and the people would drink of his spirit but not come out under the, under the banner of the blood of the Lamb. Today we walk forth in freedom under the banner of the blood of Jesus, under the banner of the blood of the Lamb, we come out of the house of slavery, out of the house of bondage, to worship him and serve him in spirit and in truth. We are his disciples. And John, the starter of this revolution, the forerunner of this revolution, said, Behold the Lamb, follow him. He, I must increase and he must decrease. What is a Christian? a follower of the Messiah. He's not a second-hander. He's not a follower of a Christian tradition. He's not a follower of Martin Luther. He's not a follower of Mother, Mother Teresa. He can be an admirer of these people, but we are followers of Jesus. What a challenge. He has grabbed you. He has called you. He has wooed you. He has filled you with his life. He has loved you with an everlasting love. He has taken pity on you and on me. He has washed us. He has cleansed us. He has paid us. He has bought us. He has won us. He has drafted us. He has called us. He has sent us. He has transformed us. We are his. If you read this the account and the story of the Reformation. It is a tragic story, really. Because it wasn't long before each region, each king decided which version of Christianity would be the established version of Christianity in his region. And so the legacy of the Reformation was terrible, Injustice, terrible uh, inequity, lack of freedom and persecution for those who are different. In the British Isles, the king and queen of Britain, United Kingdom and Ireland, it was in those days, or whatever they called it, Great Britain and Ireland, decided to go the way of the Reformation and to make the Anglican Church, the official Church of Britain and Ireland. In Germany, some of the Dukes made Lutheranism, which they call Evangelical Christianity over there, the official religion of some regions, Catholicism, some areas. Now, battery. Can you hear me? In these islands, the tragedy, this is a terrible tragedy that we've inherited. We must break beyond this. We must go forward. We must be different. We must seize these days. This is the day. Because they are days of tremendous urgency and climax. The generation out of which I came were visited mightily with the Spirit. But for the most part, we blew the opportunity. 
because we wanted the praises of men more than the approval of God. We wanted people to like us more than we wanted to obey Jesus. Back to the Reformation history. In the British Isles, the Queen involved on Henry VIII, who was a blackguard, as were so many of these leaders, made the Anglican Church the official church of Great Britain and Ireland. His daughter, Queen Elizabeth, eventually inherited the throne. She was a good person. She wanted to have people reading the Bible. She wanted the Bible translated into Gaelic. She wanted every Irish person to have the Bible in their own language. The Pope issued a decree that anyone of Great Britain and Ireland who paid taxes to the Queen, supported the Queen, or followed the civil government of which he was the ruler, would be guilty of sin. Now, we poor Irish people were caught in the middle. Obey the king or the queen, or obey, obey the law, lawful authority. Not maybe the best or favored authority, but the lawful one. Or obey the pope. So we got split. To be loyal to the king was to be disloyal to the pope. To be loyal to the pope was to be disloyal to the king. What does the Bible say? Obey the government. So we were caught between a rock and a hard place. A rock and a hard place from which we have never moved. The legacy of the Reformation was to lead us with state religions, which were inherently intolerant to every other religion. That's why when the pilgrims left these shores for America, they were able to make a land where there was religious freedom. How can Christianity function where there's not freedom? How can it drink the poison of state sponsorship and ride the back of the beast as it sees in the book of Revelation? And so we've had Christianity in Europe almost completely dead. Almost completely dead because it has ridden the back of state sponsorship and intolerance of those who share different views and opinions. So in England, Anglican Church was the official church. Everything else was outlawed. In Germany, in some dukedoms, Evangelical Church was the official church. Everything else was outlawed. In Catholic France, Catholic Church is the official church. Everything else is outlawed at the penalty of death. What sort of expression of Christianity is all this post-Reformation junk? And yet the truth released at the Reformation, that Scripture must be the prime authority, that any doctrine must stand the test of, of, of Scripture, and that the just shall live by personal faith in Jesus. Now, we need to understand the mess that we're in to find a way out of the mess we're in. Because John the Baptist did a similar thing in his day. In the days just before John the Baptist and Jesus, the temple had been taken over by gangsters from the Roman Empire who had fired the real priests, expelled them, and placed in lackey priests who weren't even of the priestly families. So John was saying, this is what's going on in the temple. That's not the pure religion of God anymore. It's corrupted. It's destroyed. It's emaciated. So when Jesus and John came with a challenging message, they weren't blaming the people. We're not blaming the people. We're saying what we've inherited is an abominable, disastrous mess. What we've inherited in Ireland with this horrible legacy of Catholic and Protestant and forcing you to take sides, which do you hate more? I don't live there. I live in the kingdom of God where I love everyone. I love my enemies. The enemies don't know whether they're my enemies or friends because I treat them the same way. We belong to a different kingdom. 
Our kingdom doesn't need political support. It'd be nice if we had it. But it doesn't need it. We're not addicted to it. We're not afraid to be outlaws. We're not afraid to be unpopular. We're not afraid to be a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The mess we've inherited in Europe from Lutheran, Catholic, Anglican and the rest is disastrous. It's not the fault of, we're not blaming Pope anybody. We're not blaming Bishop of Canterbury anybody. We're not blaming Lutheran pastors anybody. But it's certainly not the faith of Jesus and the faith of the book of Acts. Now emerging since the 20th and now flowering hopefully in the 21st century is a new movement of people who are going to go further than the Reformation, who will not depend on state sponsorship, but who will behold the Lamb and say, we want to be his followers. We're counterculture. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be consciously, deliberately, intentionally, counterculture. Ecclesia, save yourself, said Peter on the day of Pentecost, from this wicked generation. Wow! <laughs> And he was of that generation. He was a young guy. Save yourself from this wicked, corrupt, past sell-by date, Christianity, moldy, three-quarters dead Christianity, and follow the Lamb. Be like St. Dennis. Be like Brendan. Be the radicals for the Lord. And love and forgive those. Because you're, if you don't forgive, you're impaled and stuck to the past. But don't be bound either. Jesus was not bound by the opinions of high priest or Sadducee or Pharisee or the traditions of the elders. He was a liberated human being because he was a surrendered human being. What a time to be alive. What a time to be at the national day of repentance and prayer. I put the repentance first. <laughs> Repent. Repent is not a bad thing. Repentance doesn't mean I'm a hor to say I'm a horrible person. Hey, I want to get back on track with God. We were made for him. We were made to walk with the angels. We were made to walk in the holy places. We were made to walk in the presence of the Most High God. We were made to be sons and daughters of God. Not people of carnality and of filth and of the gutter. We were made to stride and have the nature of the Son of God. He came to share his nature for us, to take the blame, the shame, the condemna condemnation of all our disastrous behavior, those of our ancestors all the way back to the Reformation, all the way back to the Middle Ages, all the way back to Constantine, all the way back to the book of Acts, all the way back to Noah, all the way back to Adam. He came to take all the shame, that's what the cross did. And what did the resurrection do? It gave us a brand new nature. He says, now, as the Father sent me, so also I'm sending you. As I was in the world, so also you were in the world. And they won't, just like they didn't recognize me, they won't recognize you. But you walk before me, seek my kingdom, walk in his ways, and my heavenly Father will love you. He'll make his home with you. He will bless you. He will take care of you. And when they persecute you, just keep on going, keep on smiling, keep on forgiving, keep on turning the other cheek, keep on praising God because it's a sign you're having impact. A church that's not being persecuted is a church that's having no impact. It's cozied up with the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. That's why I like to speak to younger people. You're not so embedded with the world yet. Get out of bed with the world and follow him. In the book of Romans, he speaks about three dimensions of freedom. It's in Galatians, he uses the ringing phrase, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What we have is a pacified, emaciated, cowed and intimidated Christianity that says, yes, get born again, but immediately submit to the old order that kept us in chains. There's got to be a breakout. As soon as the blood was applied to the slaves of Egypt, there was a breakout. And there's got to be a breakout generation. 
Breaking out because we've broken in. Breaking out because we've broken through. In Romans, there are three dimensions of freedom. All accomplished by the death of Jesus, by the resurrection of Jesus, and by the calling of Jesus. The first freedom, we love to talk about it, and I love to talk about it. It's the great revolution, and it was the restoration of this truth that triggered the Reformation, even though it wasn't nailed to the doors on Wittenberg 500 years ago this week. It came later that he took a stand for justification by faith. Justified by faith, we have peace with God. By faith in what? By faith in the love of God, is it? No, we're not justified by faith in the love of God. Justified by faith in the grace of God. No, we're not justified by faith in the grace of God. Justified, he says it in Romans 3, 23 to 26, one long sentence. He says, God set for Jesus to be the propitiation of our sins. Propitiation, big word. It means God transferred onto him. All the guilt, all the blame, all the shame, all the condemnation, all the curse, all the public disgrace and humiliation that your sins and my sins deserved, God transferred it onto him. He became a propitiation for us. And because I believe he did it, I have faith in that fact and I'm totally accepted in the beloved. To be justified by faith is to put your faith in that great redemptive reality. To be justified is to stand in his presence without any sense of inferiority or guilt. To be justified is to stand fully accepted in the beloved, not on the ground of our performance, not on the ground of our church membership, not on the ground of sacraments or traditions, not on the ground observance of medieval ways that are way past their sell-by date, but by faith in the historic reality of the cross of Jesus. <laughs> fully accepted, fully released, fully restored because he took the blame that I deserved and he transferred into me his righteousness. You'll never get over it. It's unfair. I don't deserve it. But it's this amazing exchange. And the gospel was the proclamation of this great reality this great truth, this great message to the ends of the earth. The curse is broken over our lives. The alienation from God's love is gone. And now God has a free passage to pour his love, his nature, and his life into the depth of every one of our hearts. And we're swimming in his goodness for the rest of our lives. It's incredible. You're his favorite person in the whole world. You're fully restored. You want everybody else to know what you know because it has changed you so much. You're restored to the presence and the glory of God. It says, oh, it's fallen short of the glory. Now him, we're restored to the glory realm. We're drinking in his glory. It's not an achievement on our behalf through religious effort. It's a position that's been given to us on the basis of the propitiation. It's too late for the devil to do anything about it. <laughs> it's mine. It's real. I believe it. It's faith in this fact, a fact that needs to be proclaimed in Ireland, in Europe, to the ends of the earth. And meantime, that shabby old worn out religion, they're playing ecumenical games with one another while Europe dies. Praise God for the evangelists, for the guys who go in the street with their jeans and their scruffy coats, who have no title, no salaries, who are the offscoring of the world, who get no praise from man, who get wet in the evening, whose tracks are saturated with the falling rain, whose fingers are numb and blue from the cold weather and are reaching out to some poor guy in the gutter. These are the heroes. These are the real clergy. These are the real citizens of the kingdom of God and champions of God's kingdom today. But there's another freedom. It's not just the freedom of guilt. It's freedom from that old selfish nature. John already mentioned it. 
Because the redemption that's in Jesus. And the prophet saw this. Isaiah 53, he said he would be wounded for our transgressions, forecasting, foretelling the blame being transferred. But Ezekiel goes even further. I'll take out the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within them. Not only does he reconcile us, not only does he justify us, but he extracts that wicked, selfish side of our nature and replaces it with his very own spirit. Jesus faltered and he wasn't afraid to fault the old time religion. He said the trouble with it, there's not enough gospel in it. You clean the outside of the cup. You civilize people. You Christianize them. But you don't transform them. You clean the outside of the cup. But from within, what's coming from within? Lewdness, anger, lust, jealousy, murders, envies. These are the things that corrupt a nation. And Jesus and John said, basically, that Judaism, that the Jewish people of Judea and Samaria, his own people were as corrupt as any. They needed the cleansing of the blood and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because John said, behold the Lamb. He is the one who will saturate you with the Holy Spirit. He'll clean the inside of the cup. He'll do what the Pharisee and Pharisees and teachers of the law can never do. Only Jesus can put a new nature in us. He implants into us who once had that wicked, fallen, corrupted, lewd, lustful, angry, murderous, corrupt, addicted nature. He'll extract it from us. He's done it for me. He's done it for Mark. He's done it for John. He took it out of us. He didn't just forgive us. He extracted it from us in a heart transplant and put the same spirit that was in Jesus in us. <laughs> So now this new nature is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, humility, boldness, authority, wisdom. It's his nature. So it's not that we're improved. It's that there's somebody in us who's not us. <laughs> and we ask him to manifest Lord, manifest your nature in me 24-7. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of the nature of Jesus. Jesus said when he spoke, first spoke about this to the woman of the well with the five husbands and a boyfriend, a great candidate for a new heart. <laughs> I tell you, these people with five husbands and a boyfriend are going to make it into the kingdom of God a lot of, quicker than those religious people. They're not there yet, but they're coming. <laughs> he said, if you knew the gift of God, one drink, one touch from the master, one invitation from him, one laying down of your old heart and receiving of his nature, then you'll be free. For the gospel is not just remission, freedom from the guilt and freedom from the alienation and restoration to his favor. But it's also the removal of the Adamic nature and the replacing of the Adamic nature with the Jesus nature. Because he wants to repopulate Ireland and repopulate all nations with sons and daughters of God. What's the problem with America? A lot of people have hard hearts. Now I notice the Irish media loves to point out the sins of America. What's the problem with Ireland? A lot of people have hard hearts. Same problem worldwide. What's the answer? Justification. On the basis of the propitiation. That people put their faith in that. And then the receiving of a new heart, which is the Holy Spirit. There are the two great liberations. But there's a third liberation. And I feel we'll never, ever have revival in Ireland. Never. Never. Another generation will go down the sand where thousands of sermons get poured into the, into the sand of Ireland, get washed away until we come to this next level of liberation, also in the book of Romans. 
The third liberation is the liberation from self and self's agenda. If anybody would be my disciple, these are the words of Jesus. They're eternal. They don't change from the 21st century to the first century. If anyone would want to be my follower, to be a fruitful martyrian for me, if anybody would want to be my disciple, let him abandon his own personal goals for his life and accept my goals for your life. For he who holds on to his life, loves his life, he holds on to his own plans and goals and thinks that the gospel is a methodology by which you can get God to answer all your plans and goals. You're entering into a corrupted gospel. But he who abandons his goals and seeks my way and seeks my direction and seeks to live for me will find that my blessing will be on everything he does. And I therefore, I, Paul picking up these words of Jesus and putting them in his own way because he digested the truth. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, sisters, by the mercies of God who's done all this restoration for you, who has liberated you, restored you, favored you, blessed you, canceled the curse, filled you with his spirit, filled you with his life, blessed you with every blessing in the heavenly places, added his spirit, removed the curse, and caused you sons and daughters. I beseech you now for whom all this has been done, who've discovered these great realities, that you now make it the highest priority of your life to live for Jesus, to live for his agenda, to seek this, oh Lord, how can I serve you with my little life? upon the earth and the few decades that I walk upon this dusty planet? How can I serve you with my life? How can I be a blessing? He doesn't say abandon your job. He says be good at your job. Serve people with your job. And God will bless it. But at the same time, seek my face. Present yourself as a living sacrifice, not as a dead one. <laughs> as someone who's going to live for him, as a mighty force. <laughs> as forced to be reckoned with, as a little whirlwind for Jesus. We need whirlwinds for Jesus in the land. I'm living for Jesus. And the husbands and the wives say, are you on? Will we live for Jesus? Will we ask God and seek him? How can we be a blessing? How can we further this game in Ireland How and beyond? Is there any way we can be your blessing? How can we fulfill the Great Commission? How can we advance the gospel in Ireland? How can we show his merciful love to those who need it most? That will be the highest priority of our lives. And then, of course, we'll do our job and we'll do these other things that God gives us. Because there are three areas. There's the area of the spirit. There's the area of the mind and the area of the body. Keep our bodies fit. We feed our bodies, nurture our bodies, provide for our bodies. We educate our minds. Wonderful. It's great that so many people have university degrees. But the most important part is that that spirit, that spirit is alive and burning and living for him. And that we're directed by goals that don't come from this world or from Google or from Apple or from Intel or from the European Union, or from the Irish Times, gold, or from our family, or from ourselves, but goals that come from the throne of heaven. Oh God, would you show me how I can be a blessing? Show me where to go, what to do, what you want me to do in my life. Would you overshadow me with the Holy Spirit? Would you bind me to your will? Would you loose me from anything that's hindering your will? I want to be your disciples. I gladly give up my plans and goals to discover your plans and goals. For he who loves his life will lose it, and he who loses his life will find a much greater, much more wonderful, fulfilled life in him. Desperately in Ireland today, we need disciples who will come to this third area of liberation. Nominal Christianity will not hack it anymore. 
Diluted Christianity will not hack it anymore. Worldly conformed to this world Christianity will not hack it. But in the, a body of people, a, a glow and burning with the Spirit of God will take this nation. 300 will do it. Don't count the numbers. 300 will do it. Uh, Gideon had to bail out the numbers. Dead beaters. Nominals, half-hearted, 300 people on fire for Jesus will win this land for him. Are you on? <laughs> Nula, would you share? <laughs> now, I, I, I just feel that it would be wrong to add anything to you to the, what Paul has said this morning because I know what he had in his head. You know, we, we talk about what we're going to share, but I tell you, I heard God speak this morning. It wasn't Paul who spoke to you this morning. I know that very, very well. I know Paul very well. I love him greatly. But I heard God this morning, and I hope you heard God and took it to heart if you love this land. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, Liberation One, fully accepted in the Beloved because of the propitiation. How many will say amen to that one? How many will proclaim this great propitiation? Let's stand and we'll just seal this with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful message of the redemption that's ours. To the